In this lesson, we will review a multifamily acquisition from the viewpoint of an investor. This will give you a better idea of how investors analyze investment properties and what they look for in determining if a property is worth buying or not. Real estate investors are looking for a return on their investment. This is very different from single family home buyers who buy based on emotions, proximity to schools, quality of the neighborhood, etc. Let's start by reviewing the property. The property is a 128 unit multifamily complex that consists of eight separate buildings surrounding an interior courtyard. The rental units consist entirely of one and two bedroom apartments. The property is stable with a 97% occupancy rate. The property is considered a Class B multifamily asset in a Class A neighborhood. Let's take a minute to review what these classes mean. Properties can be classified in three different classes, Class A, Class B, and Class C. Class A assets are typically the newest and best buildings in the neighborhood. They are typically less than 10 years old and include a full range of amenities. Class B assets are anywhere from 11 to 25 years old with some amenities. Overall, the property is still in good condition, but just not as nice as a Class A asset. Class C assets are 25 years plus in age. They typically have little to no amenities. Overall, these assets are outdated and in poor condition. In terms of neighborhoods, Class A neighborhoods are considered the best. These neighborhoods are well maintained, offer good transportation, good schools, have low crime rates, and typically have the most expensive properties. Class B neighborhoods are still considered good neighborhoods, but the infrastructure, schools, and overall quality of properties is not as good as a Class A neighborhood. Class C neighborhoods are considered the least desirable neighborhoods. For our example, the investor wants to purchase a property in the best neighborhood. However, they don't necessarily want the best property in the best neighborhood. The reason being is that a Class B asset has room to increase in value while the desirability of the surrounding neighborhood will allow the investor to increase rents over time. The investor's strategy is to upgrade the property, increase the rents, and add additional sources of income. The investor is also looking to decrease expenses by hiring a new management company to run the property more efficiently. Now that we know a bit more about the property and the investor's game plan, let's go into the basic setup of the deal. The investor is looking to purchase the property for $5,225,000, which amounts to $40,820 per unit. The current net operating income is $492,125, which gives us a capitalization rate of 9.42%. This is a very high cap rate for a Class B property in a Class A neighborhood. Besides the down payment and closing costs, a minor renovation reserve of $95,000 will need to be set aside for a few cosmetic upgrades to the apartments. In total, the investor will need to make a cash investment of $2,100,000 to purchase the property. Next, let's go over the mortgage information for the property. The lender requires a 30% down payment, which amounts to $1,567,500. The loan is 30-year fully amortizing in the amount of $3,657,500 with an interest rate of 4.25%. This gives us an annual debt service of $215,912. Overall, these are very favorable financing terms for the investor. A jumbo loan of this amount 
typically commands a higher interest rate from the lender. If needed, such favorable financing terms give the investor the ability to pay a slightly higher purchase price and still reach their return on investment goals for the property. Now that we know some of the basic acquisition and financing numbers for the deal, let's dive into the investor's pro forma for the property. This is a document that the investor produces, which shows how they think the property will perform in the near future. It's important to note that while some of the numbers are more straightforward, such as the annual debt service or the amount paid in taxes, most of the numbers are based on assumptions by the investor. Based on their experience, they have to try and predict where they think the income and expenses will be in the future. Ultimately, the accuracy of this document is only as good as the investor's assumptions. That being said, let's go through the pro forma and explain how the investor is generating their income and expense numbers for the property. First, we'll go over the property's income. The top line of the income is always the potential gross income. This number represents what the property will earn if all of the units were 100% occupied. It's the most the property can generate in income from rent. We will see this number steadily increase over the next five years. This is due to an anticipated rent increase each year. The investor plans to raise rents by 5% for the first two years, followed by a 3.5% and 3% rent increase in the last two years. The investor assumes this because of the quality of the neighborhood. The rents are currently undervalued, and the demand for the neighborhood is high enough to steadily increase rents. While the potential gross income assumes a 100% occupancy rate, this is unrealistic. Even in the best buildings, a management company needs a month or two to complete minor repairs and renovations and find a new tenant after the old tenant moves out. You must take into account vacancy, concessions, and loss to lease. In our example, the investor is assuming a 6% vacancy factor. This represents the potential income that is not realized because a unit currently does not have a tenant. A 6% vacancy factor is conservative for this building, especially since the existing vacancy rate is only 3% as mentioned earlier in the lesson. Next, we have concessions. Concessions represent discounts that the management company may offer to prospective tenants to entice them to rent an apartment as quickly as possible. A common example of a concession is offering the tenant the first month's rent for free. In this case, the investor is assuming they will offer a total of 1% of the total gross income in concessions each year. After concessions, we have loss to lease. This number represents the amount of rent below what the landlord could collect if the apartments were rented at full market value. For example, if an apartment is currently being rented for $900 per month, but has the potential to be rented for $1,000 per month, the loss to lease would equal $100 per month. Sometimes, even a concession is not enough to entice renters, so the landlord will have to drop the rent. This occurs even in the best buildings. Perhaps a tenant moves out during the winter months when the rental market is slower, and the landlord does not want to wait until the springtime to find a new tenant. They may be forced to drop the rent below market value to attract a new tenant more quickly. In our case, the investor is assuming a loss to lease of 1.5% of the potential gross income. The last line item from the income section is other income. This represents additional revenue the investor can collect beyond rent. A common example includes laundry facilities for the tenants. In our case, the investor plans on adding storage units and additional parking spaces that will be rented out to the tenants. The investor assumes the additional income will amount to 4.2 to 6.5% 6 
of the potential gross income. Finally, we get to the effective gross income. The effective gross income equals the potential gross income minus vacancies, concessions, and loss to lease, plus other income. Always remember that potential gross income is the top line item for income, while effective gross income is the bottom line. Effective gross income represents the actual income collected from the property. Next, let's cover the expenses section of the pro forma. First up are property taxes. The tax rate is set at 2.543%. This is a total combined tax rate that includes city, county, and school district taxes. It's important to remember that the tax rate is applied to the assessed value, not the market value. In our case, the assessed value at year one is $4,180,220. The investor then assumes the assessed value, and thus the amount paid in property taxes will increase at 2% per year. Next we have property insurance. The amount paid in insurance will jump in year two as the value of the property increases. The investor can shop around for the best insurance rates and lock in a multi-year deal. Repairs and maintenance refer to smaller items that need to get fixed on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, changing light bulbs, touching up paint in the hallways, or preventative maintenance items such as changing an air conditioning filter. The investor set the repairs and maintenance budget at $54,400 and assumed a 3% increase each year. Administrative fees are assumed to be $16,000 in year one and then increase at 3% per year. Next, we have the property management fee which is set at 4% of the effective gross income. Property managers typically charge a fee as a percentage of the property's income. As the income increases, so does the management fee. Most owners will hire a property manager to run the day-to-day -day operations of the property. The property manager is responsible for maintaining the property, finding new tenants, dealing with tenant-related issues, and trying to increase the overall value of the property. This allows the investor to be hands-off from the property after closing, which frees up their time to find other investment properties. It's always important for investors to work with competent property managers. Otherwise, the wrong property manager can actually decrease the value of the property. Next, we have electric and utility expenses. These typically include electric, gas, and water bills for the common areas of the property. The tenants will be responsible for paying their own electric and gas bills. Like the administrative and maintenance expenses, electric and utility expenses are assumed to increase at 3% per year from the base amount of $75,000 in year one. Next, we have marketing expenses. These are expenses incurred trying to acquire new tenants. In this case, the marketing expenses will mostly include online advertising since the management company has their own in-house broker in charge of leasing. Some management companies will hire real estate brokers to find new tenants. In that case, the marketing fee will primarily consist of the broker's commission since the broker will be responsible for paying any advertising expenses. The investor is also assuming the marketing expenses will increase at 3% per year. After the marketing expenses, we have contract services. This includes companies hired to perform various tasks throughout the property. For example, the management company may hire a landscape company to cut the grass and shrubs once a month. The initial contract services budget is set at $32,000 and will increase at 3% per year. Finally, we have payroll expenses. This includes the salaries for both the full-time and part-time employees who work at the property. 
It's important to note that employee salaries are not included in the property management fee. The investor assumes payroll expenses will increase at 3% per year, which represent employee raises. This gives us the total expenses for the property, which amount to roughly 50% of the effective gross income. This is a total expense ratio for a multifamily property of this size. If the expense ratio were at 60%, it would indicate that the property manager is not running the property effectively. Below the expense ratio, we get the net operating income. This is a very important line item for the investor because the value of the property is directly linked to this number. Remember, the value of an income producing property equals the net operating income divided by the capitalization rate. One of the investor's main objectives is to increase the net operating income each year. This can be accomplished by increasing income, decreasing expenses, or a combination of both. That being said, the net operating income is not the actual profit the investor will realize we must first subtract capital reserves and the annual debt service. Capital reserves represent major repairs done to the property. However, rather than be stuck with a massive emergency repair bill, for example, replacing a roof for $50,000, the investor will set aside a capital reserve fund for any major expense items. It's important to note that capital reserve expenses generally increase the value of the property. In our example, the investor will set aside $300 per unit per year as a capital reserve fund. This amounts to $38,400 per year. Finally, we must subtract the annual debt service from the net operating income. This represents the mortgage payments made on the loan. Since this is a 30-year fully amortizing loan, the annual debt service will remain constant at $215,912 per year. When we subtract the capital reserves and annual debt service from the net operating income, we get the total cash flow after debt service, or net cash flow. This represents the profit from the property. However, this number is different from taxable income for the property. We have to take into account the dedications allowed by the IRS. In this case, the investor can write off the interest paid on the mortgage and depreciation. The interest paid on the mortgage can be provided by an amortization table. Note that the interest decreases each year. This is because the loan balance is gradually being paid down each month. Even though lenders consider multifamily properties as commercial, the IRS still classifies them as residential and therefore can be depreciated over 27 and a half years. However, the 27 and a half years is applied to the building only, which means we need to subtract the value of the land from the purchase price. In our example, the land is assumed to be worth $1 million. This gives us $5,225,000 minus $1 million, or $4,225,000 as the value of the building itself. Next, we divide this number by 27.5 to get $153,636. This is the amount that can be written off as depreciation each year. To determine the taxable income, you must subtract the interest and depreciation deductions from the net operating income. We subtract from the net operating income and not the cash flow after debt service because capital reserves are not a tax deductible item and the debt service includes a principal payment which is also not tax deductible. When we do the math, we see that the taxable income is less than the cash flow after debt service or profit. 
This highlights one of the major benefits of owning an investment property. Most investment properties serve as a tax shelter for the investor. In some cases, the taxable income on a property can show a loss, which means the investor does not have to pay any income taxes on their profits. This brings us to the exit strategy, which is the final analysis in our case study. The investor will have to determine at which point they will sell the property. This ultimately depends on their own investing goals. They may want to sell the property after a few years and take their equity out to buy a larger investment property. Or, they may want to hold the property and continue to benefit from yearly cash flow. The investor also has the option of increasing the value of the property to a point where they can refinance the property to extract some of their equity and then use that cash to purchase another investment property for their portfolio. Let's take a look at the exit strategy numbers line by line. The exit strategy spreadsheet shows the return on investment the investor was to realize if they sold the property after years two through five. It takes into account the net cash flow, the equity gained, and the principal pay down to determine the annualized returns. First, we have to determine the exit price, or the potential sales price at the end of each year. The investor assumes they will sell the property at an 8.25% capitalization rate. To find the sales price, we simply divide the net operating income from the first line by the capitalization rate. Next, we have to subtract the expenses related to the sale of the property. These include the sales expenses and closing costs. The sales expense primarily consists of the broker's fee and attorney fees, while the closing costs consist of more general expense items. The investor assumes the total closing expenses will amount to 5% of the sales price. Next, we have to subtract the initial loan amount, but we add back the principal pay down that has accumulated. You have to remember that the mortgage payments slowly pay down the loan balance, which essentially becomes equity for the investor. While most of the mortgage payments in the first several years of the loan consist of interest, there is still some equity gained. This is listed as $125,994 after year two, and $336,209 after year five. This information can be obtained from the amortization table. When we subtract the sales expense, closing costs, and initial loan principal, and add back the principal pay down, we get the owner's equity. However, we then have to subtract their initial investment in the deal to get the net equity or equity created. This represents a net increase in the value of the property, which can only be obtained when the investor sells the property or opts to refinance their mortgage. We have to take into account the cash flow the investor collected over the years. The cumulative cash flow lists the amount of cash received from the current year plus the previous years. For example, the cumulative cash flow at the end of year three includes the cash flow from year three plus the cash flow from year two and year one. When you combine the equity created and the cumulative cash flow, you get the total net income. Next, when you divide the total net income into the initial cash investment of $2,100,000 $144, you get the cumulative return on investment. However, most investors want to know how much they will earn on an annual basis, rather than a cumulative basis. To find the annualized return on investment, we must divide the cumulative return on investment by the number of years the investor owned the property. For example, if the investor elects to sell the property at the end of year four, the cumulative return on investment 
will be 136.90%. We must then divide this number by four years to get the annualized return on investment of 34.23%. This means the investor will earn a 34.23% return on their initial $2,100,144 cash investment for each of the four years. Also, remember that the taxable income is less than the actual income, which means the investor will be paying less in taxes on their profits from the property. In other words, the after-tax cash flow for the investor will be greater compared to other investments because of the tax shelter nature of commercial real estate. When you look at the return on investment over five years, you can start to see potential options for the investor. Since the return on investment is steadily increasing each year, the investor may elect to hold on to the property and benefit from the yearly cash flow. The investor will have to evaluate the market conditions and determine if the rental market will continue to grow over the next several years. Another option may be to refinance the property after five years. At the five-year mark, the investor will have created nearly $2 million in equity, which can be taken out of the property by refinancing the mortgage. This gives the investor the option to continue benefiting from the yearly cash flow while also getting cash to purchase another investment property. Finally, the investor can sell the property entirely and use the profits to purchase an even larger property using a 1031 exchange. A 1031 exchange will allow the investor to avoid paying capital gains, as well as having to pay back the depreciation that was deducted. In other words, a 1031 exchange will give the investor a tax shelter just by purchasing another investment property. So there you have it. A full case study analysis of the investment property from the eyes of an investor. This will help you better understand how investors use commercial properties. Investors are ultimately buying cash flow and looking to maximize their return on investment. A nice, new-looking commercial building may not work for an investor because the numbers behind the building offer too little returns for their financial goals. However, buying into a slightly older and riskier building may get the investor their desired return on investment. Ultimately, you have to understand that the mindset behind purchasing a commercial property is very different from that of a residential home buyer.